الله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين my dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I want to thank the Rutgers University MSA first and foremost uh, for organizing the second annual conference I attended the last year's as well, the, the, the launching of it, I guess, and mashallah, tabarakallah, it's growing and, and it's improving. Um, and then also my particular two connections to the conference, Sister Nishat, who is the bookings manager, who made sure all of this worked out on my schedule and, and on my part, and Brother Taha and Brother Khalid who picked me up literally about 20 minutes ago from the train uh, Amtrak station and, and, and brought me here, alhamdulillah. So may Allah bless them for their service and uh, and uh, indeed make it you know uh, on their on their scale of, of good deeds inshallah uh, i did want to tell uh our umsa to modify rule number i think it was three about the kids crying that uh if the if the kids are crying uh Yvette said to just go ahead and take care of that i think he means to go outside and comfort them <laughs> because people might interpret that differently <laughs> if you just leave that on the recording uh, uh do you hear that event? So yeah. modify that challenge <laughs> just because yeah, that's what you because I'm a father of three and I, I hope nobody would just want to take care of my kids <laughs> I hope they want to comfort them because that's what it's all about um, so inshallah in the next about you know, uh, 35 40 minutes or so I'll uh, uh, address this topic and the basic uh, uh, approach that I'm taking is the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and coming to know him and therefore achieving uh, uh, spiritual uh, purification, if you will, and that God consciousness, taqwa, is a prerequisite for that. So you're on a college campus, sometimes you sign up for courses, and there's, uh, there's a bolded last line that says prerequisite, and then something else is required. So before we talk about uh, Tazkiya, and I'm really pleased that Sheikh Mukhtar Makrawi uh, especially is on the program for later this evening. I'll be at ISCJ, but I know he'll be here. Uh, uh, and this is one of the scholars who has, mashallah, spoken about this over and over in, in, in to different audiences, so I know that will be done. My, I will limit my uh, particular comments to at least three areas. One is to, to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we begin to talk about understanding and, and knowing Him. Secondly, to come to understand really uh, how it is that we, as human beings, come to know things, and just as human beings. And then thirdly, to delve into more examples of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, how we come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore become conscious of Him, and then therefore achieve, inshallah, this tazkiyah that we're talking about. So first and foremost, we have to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it is truly by His mercy that we are granted the faculty of reasoning, logic, intellect, the ability to discern between right and wrong, cold and hot, between contrasting, uh, exi you know, our contrasting existence on earth. So this is an important thing that if you don't begin there with gratitude, that everything else that comes afterward could literally be just science. Which is why many times you read books, scientific journals, and you say, SubhanAllah, these people are studying the depths of, for example, the, the, the formation of a fetus. And yet they have no sense of belief. They have no sense of appreciation for how did this happen? How did an egg and a sperm join to, to, you know, to, give, to give rise to conception and this, this fetus came into being? So it's possible that if you start with the point outside of gratitude, that you could end up literally making this an exercise in basically semantic gymnastics. And you just kind of rush through that and formulas and equations and words and you know big jargon, jargon filled words, but nothing really comes out of it that humbles us, inshallah, to be conscious of Allah and therefore uh, uh, strive to achieve spiritual uh, purification. The second part of this is to talk about really the this notion of a, of an inner desire within human beings, within from birth basically, to explore, to get to know, to chart new courses. To, and it is, this happens, by the way, uh, I don't know how many of you have, uh, 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 because you might say, like, you know, I'm too far from my own childhood. But if you have, like, young brothers and sisters, anything, anyone have children, brothers uh, under five years old? Anyone in the audience with brothers and sisters less than five? No? Really? Mashallah. Not one person? How about anybody raising kids who are less than five years old? Because clearly you have a warning. You're, you're raising kids? Yeah. Where? The light is so bright. Yeah. I'm glad we're not doing fundraising, because I could never tell who's raising kids. Um, but the idea is that if you watch them, they're constantly looking to explore. To us, it's an annoyance. 
to us, it's like, will they stop opening those drawers? Will they stop, you know, taking out things and dumping them? All they're doing is exploring. That's their whole job in, in early childhood, is to explore. And as they explore, they start to make meaning of that which they're exploring. And this is why in homes where there is a conversation or a dialogue taking place between that child and the parent, that learning is exponential compared to the child who has to do all this alone and never get feedback. Never know whether they accomplished something or they messed up, if they made a mistake or any of that. Which is why presence of family and parents is an, is an amazing part of this. So in addition to that, we also have a, in Arabic, but the English usage of that word could be a fitratic, a fitratic inclination towards knowing our Creator, which the Prophet ﷺ told us that every child, every, chi every child, regardless of who their parents are, is born in a state of fitrah, which is a pure state, a state that inclines that child, if left alone, without socialization of any other kind, to submit ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something important for us to know. That if this is the childhood inclination, at what point do we reach a level of arrogance that we stop to look, we stop to explore, we stop to ask questions, we stop to understand or even acknowledge that we came from some, some, you know, uh, some source and that indeed we have reached this point of development in our own lives. So the key questions to ask here are, for example, how do we know? How do we come to know what we know? And it's not a philosophical question, it's a real question. How is it that we come to know what we know? We, we look, we observe, right? We look at signs, right? So this is exactly how we know. If you think about it, what makes me always smile is when I look at any kind of product and I look at the warning signs on the product. Because if you look at there, it says, for example, like a shampoo or something, it says not for, you know, ingesting or like not for, so somebody at some point drank that. <laughs> and they're like, we better put a warning that tells them this is not for drinking. It's for, you know, use it, use on, uh, to clean or whatever, right? So somehow someone explored it, some reaction occurred, and then a message was sent to reinforce that if you intend to do this, this is the way to do this. If this is your goal, this is not the way to do it, right? And these kinds of interactions between humans and their environment, the social environment, this is precisely the domain of Muslims, that we live in the social environment. That we are not expected to be monks and hermits. And the Quran talks about the notion that it was never prescribed upon them, if you will, the monks of the, the Christian religion, to, be, to go and to become celibate and to really be away from the environment. It was always to be in the environment. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was raised for the first 40 years of his life in the heart of Mecca, among the Quraysh, the people to whom he would begin talking about God about God consciousness and ultimately about Tazkiyah and self purification Also among that we come to know by existing descriptions by others of that which we're trying to know. So many of us have never been to other planets, have never been to the moon, have never really known some other parts of the world, have never known some parts of New Jersey perhaps, but you can go online, read a description, and then you say, oh wow, that's what that's about. Oh, I didn't know they had this many people there. I didn't know this was their main economy. I didn't know, for example, the CIA has a major database of, of, of nations. If you go on that, just the other day I was helping a student who was interested in working in Sierra Leone, West Africa. So you go to the CIA database and it tells you, this is the country, these are the demographics, this is the breakdown of the population by age, this is the population by religion. This so how do we know? By descriptions of others of that which we're trying to know. We also come to know by self-descriptions that people describe who they are, where they are from, and they describe to us. So for example, now a lot is going on within, with, with marriage in America, especially among the Muslim community, because we were late in planning how this process would unfold in America. We knew how it would unfold wherever we came from, but we didn't know how it would unfold in America. So we're a little bit behind the curve in trying to get young people to know each other to get married. So often the question is, what are you looking for in a spouse? And, or tell me something about yourself. So you want to get to know the other person, you read their self-descriptions. And of course you then gauge that against existing descriptions or references to say what they're saying and what is reality and what is the gap, right? And so that's one other way to, to come to know. And of course, the last way to know is by personal experience. 
is actually doing something, is actually going someplace. Right? There's no substitute to that level of knowledge. Nobody, in fact, why the most powerful uh, non-fiction uh, uh, you know, a writing that has you know, existed in, in, in human history has been where somebody was first-hand describing this is what it was like which is why we love the seerah, the life of the Prophet وسلم, because of the companions who could say for example Aisha radiallahu anha says that his head was on my lap as he was dying right? in his, in his, in his like, last days and uh, moments his head was on my lap. It's a personal experience. Nobody can make that stuff up, and nobody can, we can try to think, what was that like? But personally experiencing something, you get to know it, you get to understand it, and you get to have some sentiments or emotions attached to it. Along with that comes this notion of the Quran now being a source of knowledge for us. And what's amazing here, lately, you've heard with the, a, a lot of, emphasis on Buddhism and meditation and you might have heard this word mindfulness how many of you heard this like being thrown around lately mindfulness apparently the emails aren't getting to New Jersey <laughs> right you don't have five-year-old kids you don't have you know, anybody, nobody heard of mindfulness so I will help you to inshallah reconnect with all of us America, right? so mindfulness is something that's really big now and this is why why is it happening because people have noticed that their lives are becoming meaningless. They're working hard, but they don't know what it's about. They're raising families, but they don't know, have a clue what the destination and goal is. They have jobs, but they don't know what the career will lead to. They're in college, they don't know. So everyone's talking about being mindful, mindfulness, and this is a way to be and exist. Google it, you'll see, and I'm not making this stuff up, right? So mindfulness is closest associated with taqwa for Muslims, because it's not just mindful about the environment, because then what's the end of that? If you're not mindful about the environment, and it leads you to be grateful to the one who created the environment. Right? Are you following me? Right? And that mindfulness and taqwa, and I'll come back to that as we close, is something that Ibrahim salam at a young age developed. And he developed this art of observing his environment, of questioning his environment of connecting what the environment was, or the people in the environment were doing, the actors in the environment, to inner inclinations he was having, because Allah subhanahu says about him, he was always Hanif, he was always on the straight path. So when he starts to question the people around him, especially his parents, his community, saying that what I'm trying to grasp is God, but in my understanding, of in my limited understanding as a young man, he looks and he sees that you've created things with your own hands and then you ask those things for help. How is that possible? Or you worship planets, the, uh, the understanding of these, you know, these massive creations. And then he engages them in a rhetorical conversation. Is the sun my lord? But the sun sets. Hatha Rabbi. He said, this is my lord, but then the sun sets. Well, that can't be my lord because it left me. It left me. It's, he's rhetorically trying to get them to question what he sees in the environment. He's actively engaging with them in a dialogue until none of it really hits them, their understanding, and they don't change. And then you know the story of literally going to the statues or the gods, if you will, right? And defacing them to send a lesson, not just so that people don't walk away going, yeah, yeah, no, Al-Tab Hussein said it's graffiti and then messing with things is okay. That's not what he was doing. He was creating a deeper spiritual conversation by saying to them, ask these other lords or gods, if you will, who did what you say I did? You accuse me of. And so in this way, he's coming to you know, challenge his environment and not just take it uh, uh, passively. And again, of course, Allah SWT says about him, Makana Ibrahim, that neither was Ibrahim a, a Yahud, a Jew, nor a Christian. But he was always one who was a Muslim, a, one who submitted, and Hanif. That he was always the one who was uh, a submission, in a submission and also on the straight path. And then he also didn't commit shirk to the end of that verse in Surah Al Imran, number 67. So, in that, we get the example of a prophet of Allah as a young man. And the beauty of starting there with knowing about Allah is that if you ever talk to Christians and Jews, in their heart they know of Ibrahim, Abraham in their tradition. 
And in their heart they know that they also refer to him as the father of the prophets. As the father of the prophets. And so this notion of Abrahamic faiths is something that is deeply connected to the fact that monotheism was in Ibrahim alayhi life. That this notion of worshipping one God was knowing his God and coming to challenge his environment, engaging them by you know, almost like a Socratic method of asking questions and begging from them a response until subhanAllah, they didn't give him the response and ultimately threw him into the fire which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him and defied the laws of physics, the laws of nature if you will, saying to the fire to be cool for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So in challenging the environment, observing, we have a legacy of that within the history of Islam, within the tradition of Islam if you will. But we also come to know now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the asma wa sifat, the attributes and the characteristics, the 99 of them, the 99 of them, which to any human being, to any human being, if you just reflect upon human emotion, upon the most noble of human characteristics that anybody would want, even the Buddhists were talking about mindfulness, and anybody else from the Christians or the Jews or the Hindus, the Baha'i, whatever other faith, even the agnostics and the atheists, if you say to them, ultimately, let us put aside the question of a creator. Let us put aside the question of a divine you know, a deity. Let us put aside the question that someone, some deity is in control of all this. What do you look for to know that somebody is an upright individual? What do you look for? And these same 99 characteristics, attributes on a human level will be the ones that are narrated to you whether in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, or in North America, Australia, even if you go to Antarctica, that's what they'll talk about. The loving, the just, the compassionate, the merciful, the benevolent. Right? But they can never, they can never talk about the one who gives life, al hay They can never talk about the one who takes life. Because they can get to the point of wanting to perfect all of these at a human level, but they can never comprehend that which lived, but is not anymore alive. And that which wasn't in existence, but came into being, again, by the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when you read Surah Al-Hashr, the ending verses, all of them begin by saying that, huwa Allahu ladhi la ilaha illa hu, that he is, the, he is Allah, that there is no deity except him. And then it goes on to say, Alimul ghaybi wa shahad. That he is the one who knows that which is unseen and that which is present. And then it goes on to talk about the other attributes of him. Right? All the other characteristics of him within, the, within those three verses. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we come to understand him through the attributes that he has listed in the Quran. And you know, and I know, as you grow older, coming from three, four, five years old, in the beginning, we don't learn by huge sentences. We don't learn by huge sentences. No one gives you, I don't know of any children's books where they have like a sentence that's more than three or four words long. That's why. Because in the early stages, all we're doing in acquisition of knowledge is lists, is names. Are you following me? It's, that's all we're doing. That's all we're capable of doing. But as we grow older, we attach meaning and depth to that which we know. We know love as a child in concept. We know love as a concept. We know love in its manifestation from our parents and how they love us, if you will. But we get to know love and the pains of love when we first had experience it later on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al wadud This is the one in whom love is perfected, is completed. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is loving of all of His creation. And so these attributes are something important for us to keep in mind. Descriptions of Himself is what we get from those 99 attributes. And it's not just limited to that, but it's the basis from which to start. Second, we talked about how do we know as human beings, and I mentioned signs, right? I mean, you go on the highway, it tells you 55, right? maximum 65, 
We came back from California last week. They were like crazy out there. It was like 70, right? 70 miles an hour. It's a sign. It gives me limitations. Oh, no, I'm a free person. I want to do whatever I want. No, it tells you you can, go, you can go more than 70, but you'll pay you know, a few hundred dollars if we catch you. There's consequences. There's signs for everything. There's signs that engage you with the environment. There's signs that tell you how to disengage with the environment. If you go to the Grand Canyon, I have not been, but my nephews went, and there are clear signs that tell you, do not go past this. Why? Because past this is a slightly huge cliff. <laughs> and it could result in a little bit of scratching, if not you know, uh, bleeding, if not death. So you don't disobey that. You don't say, I'm a free person, I'm going to go past this cliff. Because the sign has a consequence. It's telling you. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts in the Quran by telling us, what mean ayatihi. And I'm on a college campus, so the best verse to recite would be the one from Surah Al-Rum about marriage, so that everybody listens up. Right? What mean ayatihi. An khalaqa lakum. Min anfusikum azwajun li taskunu ilayha. To the end of the verse. That from among his signs, because you worry about who you'll marry. You worry about who that person will be. And Allah SWT is saying from among his signs. After talking about that we created you from min min turab, the verse preceding it. He's saying that don't worry about it. Because I know your soulmate. Azwajun. That from your own souls we've created your soul mate. This is our concept. And so don't worry about it. We're here. And among his signs, and among his signs that he created from different languages. And all of these things is what? Is a way for us. All these things are what? It's a, they're ways for us to say that if I didn't know something, now I do know it. I told him it might be against Now I do know it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us from his signs. Descriptions of our creation. Let's say that none of this moved us. We're like, well, ah, these list of names, I don't know what that means. I've been around them all my life. It never affected me. Right? Compassion, no, I grew up in a house where there was domestic violence. I don't know about compassion. Right? I grew up in a, you know, in a neighborhood where there was like shooting everywhere. I came out of a, I'm a child of refugees who came out of war. I don't know compassion. I don't know mercy. I don't know love. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? And then you say, what about his signs? No, I don't, I, I see the signs, but I don't, I don't really see it. I've been trying to get married for 10 years and nothing's happening. So I see the signs, I don't. Okay, how about this? How about if the one who we're telling you to get to know starts to describe your creation, how you came into being, from a, you know, like a clot, literally, clot, that you were nothing in Surah Insan. Lam yakun shayyin madhkura that you are nothing even worthy of being mentioned. That's what Allah SWT is saying. Hal atal al insan hasn't has there no period, has there no time come for mankind to actually get to know that at one point in history, in their history, magnanimous history, that they were actually something shayyin madhkura that something not even worthy of mention. You know how when you want to make something noteworthy, you say in your writings also noteworthy is. Something, something, something. Also of importance is, Allah SWT is saying, you were even something that wasn't even worth mentioning. Did you know that? Do you know that? And then he goes on, subhanAllah, to describe basically the detailed process of what I mentioned in terms of um, uh, uh, birth, or in terms of conception at the beginning of the letter. Conception, something that still scientists are studying. Still, they don't have all the answers to. The miracle that occurs for nine months inside the womb of a mother is something they're still unable to understand. They know bits and pieces and glimpses, but it's not something they understand. And to humble us, Allah SWT is saying, not only do I know that not only is it by my will that this occurred, but I can describe to you all of those stages, all of the stages of how those cells go from the cellular level to an actual mass, a unitary mass. And that mass becomes a, a, almost like flesh, and the flesh and then bones. When you start to study this, if you never knew God, you come to understand that there must be a higher being that is in charge of all of this. And indeed, even scarier, subhanAllah, is the fact that, and this happens to you because uh, um, when I was uh, coming on the train just now, there were four women who were like best friends going to New York and they used to this trip every year so they were clearly speaking loud enough for me to listen to everything they were saying. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they were marveling on how their mother had this like intuitive 
feeling about something that was happening to them throughout their lives. So once uh, I was like four years old and my mom picked me up early from where I was playing because well, she dropped me off and then she came back to pick me up and took me and she wouldn't explain to me why. And later on, it turned out that there was an accident at that site and the kids were playing and tripped over a thing of gasoline and it became like a big deal, you know, and someone got hurt and someone got burned and this and this and this. And she felt it and she took me away. So suddenly you start to think, wow, somebody knows something of the unseen has intuition, you start to value that person. Somebody knows your inner thoughts, and especially when you get married, you realize your, the husbands and wives get to be on a certain plane where they do, if they're communicating frequently enough, that they literally don't have to communicate much verbally sometimes, it's there. Now Allah SWT is saying, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا insan That indeed in Surah Qaf, that we created man, we created, and I mean human beings, so don't keep having me to say man and woman, but you know that you're included. Women are included in all of these instances, except for direct verses that refer to man or woman. Not only did we create this man, this human being, that we know, forget even if you didn't think I knew how you came into physical being. Now I'm telling you, Allah is speaking, that I also know your innermost thoughts. That we are closer to that being than their jugular vein. Their jugular vein. So you ever talk about profiling, psychological profiling, behavior profiling, one of the things they look for for fear in people is for throbbing, like in, the, in, the, in their pulse. Throbbing, any kind of sort of uh, manifestation of discomfort that's going on, it shows up. And Allah subhanahu wa is saying, I'm closer to you than even that. So isn't that going to come to help you to know me? And subhanAllah, you can just imagine how fearful one would be. You know, we, we talk about like our phones are tapped, we're always joking, like oh, our khutbahs are tapped, our masjids are tapped, and everybody's tapped, and everybody knows what we're doing. So what does it matter, right? One of the scholars of Allah Yarham, who passed away, an Egyptian medical doctor, who was also very active in the Islamic work, uh, Ahmed al-Qadi, for the Egyptians to be Ahmad al-Adi, in case you don't recognize it. He basically said this one day at a, con a conference, and Shaykh Muhammad al-Sharif repeated it in his lectures, uh, uh, Touched by an Angel, that he came to a conference and something had happened in society, I think it was a terrorist attack and in the 90s, and, and he came to everyone and he goes, you know, I want to tell you that all of our hotel rooms are tapped, and everything that we're saying and doing in them is being re recorded. And people were like, oh my God, I knew it. Right? Everyone's like, ah, oh, we shouldn't have discussed this and that. And all he meant was that Allah SWT and His angels, in this verse, in this surah that recites Surah Qaf, are always recording everything. So He's saying to us that not only did I create you, your physical being I know, your shape I know, right? And then He's saying, I even know your innermost thoughts, things that you hide from others that nobody you wish would ever know or come to know. And now, I'm also recording it, and it'll be brought back to you in the form of books, either on your right or either on the left. And may Allah SWT make us from among those who receive our books, inshallah, on the right. I mean, So it becomes pretty humbling when even our behaviors are predicted and described in the Quran. Right? Because if you want a user's manual about anything, that's what you want. You want something that go, you can go to the index and look up and say, this is a noise that's coming from my car. This is, you know, uh, th that's what I predict is going to happen in the future. Is that basically everything will be online, everything will be electronic, everything. So you won't have to like describe to the mechanic. You just, you just record the sound, and then the sound is associated with something that they've already had, like a database of sounds, that this is approximately within this range of sounds. And then they can figure out what's wrong with your car, and then we just will go on with them. But here's Allah saying, I know your behaviors. I know when that you will lie, that you will cheat, dishonesty. But I also know the positives, compassion, caring, love. Right? This notion of the capacity to love. Behaviors that will be, inshallah, uh, positive and helpful to society. So if all of that didn't help us understand it, if all of that didn't humble us, then ultimately, he just says, let me just describe to you the blessings that I gave you. If all of that didn't help, let me just describe the blessings that I gave you. 
all of the blessings, and the blessings, the beginning of which, of, of which is the blessing of the religion itself, right? That al-yawma akwaltu lakum that on this day have I perfected your religion for you, completed your religion for you. Wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, that I've, you know, basically my ni'mah, my blessings have been given to you. This is something that is the beginning of everything. But then throughout the Quran, because he's dealing with human beings that he created, an insan, the one in whom forgetfulness is complete, that's like the, the notion of forgetfulness, then he says, I'm going to give you blessings in Surah Ar Rahman. What's the repeating verse of Surah Ar Rahman? Fabi? I knew there were some Egyptians in the audience. <laughs> The Imam stops and he goes, Fabi and they're like, Allah, you're not being come back. And the Daisies are like, what? What's going on? Don't yell at us. Right? That's basically what they're saying is that completing the verse. Fabi ayya ala irabbikuma to kazima. Then which of your favor which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? And in other verses, Lam Yahtasibu, that you won't be able to account, take account of the blessings. That you won't know from where they came. You won't be able to grasp how a solution was brought to you. And all and on and on and subhanAllah, <coughs> there may still be a chance that somebody doesn't quite uh, uh, understand what's happening. So let me start to close and wrap up. If we still don't know or don't want to know, because we go through a period in life when we just don't want to know. People are texting you, you don't respond. Emailing you, you don't care. Calling you, you don't respond. Inviting you, you don't respond. Calls are coming through, you don't really care. You're just on your own. I want to be myself. I want to find myself. I want to do soul searching. Soul searching is amazing in Islam. Because ultimately it should lead you towards the one who created your soul. Towards the one who knows the inner whisperings of your soul. Towards the one who can help you to purify your soul. And so, if you deny his Allah, if you deny his favors, if you deny the prophets, if you deny the books, then Allah SWT is very clear. He says, well, okay, fine. Let me just tell you stories of the people who came before you, who did what you're doing, who denied me, who associated partners with me, who denied my existence, who denied my prophets, who denied my signs, who denied my books, who made fun of, fought with, you know, put down my angels. There was punishment. There was punishment. There were consequences. Human beings understand consequences because he gave us the intellect to know right from wrong, hot from cold, high from low, contrasts in all of our existence. And so he says, let me tell you just the story of the Ad, the story of the Thamud, the people of Nuh he called, it, he called them a thousand less fifty. The Quran, the Quran says the number of years, 950 years. Let me just tell you about the people of Lut. Let me just people, you know, to, to tell you basically of the people of the past who did all of these things and then won't that make you humble? Won't that make you know me? Won't that make you understand me? They existed. If you go to Jordan, you see some of these magnanimous structures that have been created, these, you know, homes in the, the dwellings in the mountains and the dwellings in the hills. They exist. You still see it. You see the end of the Roman Empire. You still see the existence of it. You see what was there and it, what is not there now, and still we may be denying it. And subhanAllah, the context of it tells us, and the, and the, and the takeaway points here for this portion of the lecture, and it's really to, intended to set the tone for all of what's to come later today, is to basically say that the context does matter. That we're talking about understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're living at a time, during times, where Allah has, or God, has all but been removed from society. Has all but been removed from society to the extent that the height of philosophy, falsafa, was to give us an appreciation of the Creator, not to ask question, or the question, is God dead? Allah forgive us from ever uttering those words. Not to reach the heights of civilization, of invention, of discovery, of innovation, to come to reject God. No. This can't be the path forward. But that's the context in which we live. And it is possible that the natural disasters, the human caused disasters, such as war and devastation and destruction, 20 children gunned down in Newtown, Connecticut, and someone says, well, where was God? 
If you talk about a merciful God, where was God that day? He allowed these 20 kids to die and the six teachers to die. And this is the, the, the fate that they suffered. We look at all of these things and we say it is all a part of the will of Allah who knows better than us, who knows the goodness inside the evil looking situation that may have occurred. And we don't. And we shouldn't try to get to know but we should appreciate the fact that He is in charge. He is in charge. The simplest example I can give you is when you're in an airplane. How many of you have uh, you know, flown in an airplane? Asking a Muslim audience who are scared it's being recorded. I'm just asking you if you have flown in an airplane. <laughs> Nothing else to do with the airplane, right? Just flown in an airplane, right? You know when there's turbulence, even the most confident of human beings has a slight prick in their heart to say, is this it? Is this it? I sat next to, over the South Pacific Seas, uh, uh, on the way to the Philippines, next to a drunken man. And I knew he was drunk when he got on the plane. And he was out, cold. When that turbulence hit, you should have seen the fear that woke him up. Because he was out of his mind, out of his consciousness. And here was something that could take his life. But the reason I brought the example up is when, they, when there is turbulence, it's because of the place, the, feet, the, the altitude at which the plane is flying. And the pilot may, the pilot may have to take a very steep dive or a steep rise above that turbulence to get away from it. Are you following what I'm saying? You're experiencing it, but you're just making dua because you know ultimately the one who is in charge of that plane knows what he's doing, is guided by some system to allow him to decide how to decrease or increase that altitude to, to remove the turbulence. Are you following me? So Allah is in charge. We don't have to worry about that. So the taqwa, the God consciousness is such that people say, well tell us in real terms man, what does it mean? It is not fear of Allah. The Quran is very clear. Khawf is the word for fear in the Quran. We mistranslate when we say taqwa is fear. Ittaqullah, be conscious of Allah. When we say to each other, when you're doing something wrong or you know, getting carried away with your tongue, someone says ittaqullah ya have Be conscious of Allah ya because the consciousness of Allah leads to, leads to, inshallah, an ability to re, you know, uh, focus your compass, bring back your focus and energies and say, man, I was going off track. I am so glad. This is what your GPS tells you, recalculating route. Why? Because you screwed up and didn't go on the right path. Recalculating route, right? At the next you know, legal U-turn, make the next legal U-turn. Why? Because you screwed up. This is your soul, your nafs is your inner compass. And everything, the waswasa that comes, your inner compass, if it's set, it can control and command it and say, you know what, that, I'm not even listening to that stuff, that's going to take me down another path. That, I'm not looking at because that's going to take me down another path. She is not mahram to me, for me to observe her and to look at her like this. She is not my wife. I can't look at her like this. I can't treat someone like this with my tongue or my hands in terms of violence or, or harshness. And so, what can we do about it? Let me close with some practical points. First and foremost, you know, in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah SWT is very clear after talking about addressing the believers, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqullaha wal tanthu nafsun ma That be conscious of Allah and look to see, what have you prepared for tomorrow? Really, in, on college campuses, that's why we have these conferences. That's why like most of my adult life, or post-teen life has been, on college campuses conveying this message, nothing else. Is that this is where growth occurs and this is where growth becomes sustainable. The nafs, the soul, if it's conquered in college, ideally it would be conquered in high school. And that's when I give lectures to high school students. Ideally it would be done there. If you can do it there, it's done. And then no distraction, no amount of you know, uh, sensationalism in life can distract you from the worship of Allah. But that surah, the next verse is what's the scary verse about this session, for this session to close with. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ Allah SWT is saying, and don't be like those who forgot Allah. He calls them to forget themselves. أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ That those are ultimately those, you go to the robber, the person who murdered, the person who committed rape and atrocities, and say, what were you thinking? Oftentimes they say, I don't know what I was thinking. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهَ after addressing us, Ya ayyuhaladina amunu, ittaqullah. Be conscious of Allah. 
And then he even then says, do not forget Allah. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهِ The ones who forgot Allah. And I mentioned insan is rooted. That that's where the word comes from. This is because we are the beings in whom forgetfulness was completed. We are like total perfection of forgetfulness. That's what we are as insan. Number one, practical points to close. We have to begin by recommitting our hearts to Allah. Nobody should assume that because I was born Muslim, I converted to Islam, reverted to Islam, rediscovered Islam, that it's just going to sort of be there and take it for granted. You'll be amazed how shaitan can work. You'll be amazed what one challenge in your life could shake even the, the roots of your belief and la qadar Allah would potentially lead you into disbelief. We have families who struggle, who call us or see us after the, the, during these conferences. My brother is 15, he hates Islam. My daughter is such and such, and she is telling us she's going to leave Islam. This is happening in the Muslim community. We're not talking about people outside of, the, of our community. So number one, recommit actively our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to do it often. Number two, we must engage in personal audits. See, the biggest thing about Islam is that it really took all of the previous religions, and this is what it did. It liberated a, a woman and a man, a human being, a man and a woman. It liberated us to say, if you want to speak to your Lord, you need no intermediary. You need nobody in between. You don't need to do anything but to turn to Him and ask Him, speak to Him. And in another tradition of the Prophet to open his book to, if, if you want him to speak to you, because the message is conveyed there. So this personal audit is one that at the end of the day, I have to say my day tomorrow can never be like today was if there were some issues with that day. Or my day tomorrow is going to be that much better because I'm going to do this, this, and this in a better way than I did today. Today I didn't pray all of the sunnah prayers that go along with the fara'id. Tomorrow I'm going to begin with at least that. Or I'm already praying all the prayers, but I'm going to strive to pray, pray the prayers on time. No matter where I am. Or I'm going to plan ahead to be sure that I'm in a place where I can pray when it's prayer time. Are you following me? This is the audit that has to happen because you and I are too weak as human beings if we don't plan properly to succeed. If we don't pro plan properly to, to be close to Allah SWT. On YouTube, just last night, uh, I don't know how I got to this clip someone had of a, of a taxi driver who was praying in New York, I think it looks like New York. Believe it or not, Allah is my witness, and I'll forward you this link if you want to really see it. You don't, you don't really have to, but he thought the cleanest place to pray on the trunk of his car with the sajada, and he is there in his full shalwar kameez, and the shalwar kameez, the back of it is being flown by the breeze, and he's going sujood, ruku. I'm going, just don't fall, man, just don't fall. <laughs> somebody may have put up a clip of him falling, because they wouldn't have known what he was doing. But clearly he was praying, he was literally praying. The personal audit will lead you not to be taken by surprise to remember Allah. Are you following me? That you won't end up in the mall and say, oh, dude, man, it's a Maghrib time. Why, how do we do this? You won't end up in this, this modern thing of a buffet, stuffing your face. And you're like, God, we're actually going to miss prayer because we're stuffing our faces. Like we didn't even plan to know where we would be to pray on time. The personal audit will get you there. Or I'm getting angry all the time, man. I'm angry at my mom, I'm angry at my dad, at my brothers, at my sisters, at my friends in the MSA on college. What is wrong with me? I gotta get this under control. La taqda, the Prophet said. Do, don't let your anger overtake you. La taqda. You know, when a man asks for advice. Think about this. Number three, uh, um, uh, commit to a daily and weekly routine. Whatever that is. One of the greatest things I had was uh, 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 through college was to keep, and back then when we talked about notebooks, it was like in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, actually it was a spiral notebook. Like now you have like notebooks that are electronic and notebooks, right? Whatever, notebooks. But those are my journeys to the religion. If I went to a conference, I had a notebook. If I heard a verse, I took it down. What was I feeling at the time that I heard that verse? Why? Because later on, I might think of it different. So I go back and say, wow, in the 90s, when I heard this verse, I thought of this. 
When I read this hadith, it meant that to me then. Now I have kids, and now it means something else. Which was that? Take advantage of five before five. Your time before you become occupied. I had no clue what that meant until my wife and I now have three kids. We're like, we are occupied, man. Like 24 seven, we are occupied. We're homeschooling, so my wife is 24 seven. And I mean, it's endless. I never knew what that meant. I'm like, take advantage of my time before occupied. I have so much time. Now I have no time. Like absolutely no time. But now when I look back, that's what I felt then. What are you doing to have a daily and weekly routine? Are you going to pray, fast? You know, what is, is it going to be the Quran? Is it going to be part of a halakha? This revival is an ongoing process, but it has to start at each individual level. Number four and last, to conclude, and I mean this, like it, this is something that can affect your social life in a big way, so listen up carefully. Surround yourselves. Surround yourselves with people who understand Allah, who know Allah, who love Allah, who are conscious of Allah, and this is why, for the advice of marriage, the person with whom you will share the rest of your life, surround yourself with the one who reminds you of Allah. That's what that, that's what that means. And that's what that means. I mean, if you're going to marry someone, marry someone who reminds you of Allah. Surely you're not going to marry somebody. No, surely somebody's not going to remind you of Allah if they're a very angry person. They're not going to remind you of Allah if their clothing is so tight that, I mean, you, they could burst if they moved. Right? <laughs> They're not going to remind you of Allah, they shouldn't. Because you, you, as the moment you look at it, you have to look away. This is not something. Right? The person who's not disciplined is not going to remind you of Allah. The person who's not punctual is not going to remind you of Allah. So surround yourself. And this means that you will have to let go of some people. And this is not a problem. This is not, you're not, you don't have to go out on Facebook and say, I said salams today to Ibad and you know, Khalid and Taha, have a good life, I'm becoming a stronger Muslim. No, that's not what I mean, right? <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about slowly creating a noticeable distance so that they can long for your company. They can long for your company. They can say, man, I miss you, Taha. Where have you been, man? And he says what? He says, you know, yeah, I'm, I know when you guys went out that night, I was at the masjid, because we we're doing a community service project. Or when you guys were doing this, the sisters and somebody else says, yeah, and you know, we, we got together because we were helping another sister, and she was going through some rough times, so we all went and, you know, and kind of uh, met with her and gave her some company. I know we could have gone out, I know we could have had fun, but that's what I chose to do. And they, they start to miss you from the circles that they had created, because you're in circles that are purer for you, better for you, inshallah. So as I, I close by summarizing essentially what I said, that we have to begin with gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has blessed us with. Number two, we have to begin to understand that human beings innately, internally, in, are inclined to seek, to explore, to get to know. And to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has given us all of these ways. His attributes and characteristics, His signs, descriptions of Himself, Descriptions of our creation and our behavior. Descriptions of our uh, predictions of our potential uh, you know, uh, 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 transgressions against him and even the good behaviors that we're capable of. But then ultimately, descriptions of the bounties and the blessings that has given us. Because all of that leads to being conscious of him and hopefully inclining towards keeping our soul pure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us and whatever mistakes have made our mind, whatever blessing comes is from the mercy and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.